I know you're there. Good afternoon and welcome to part two of the Benedictine Sisters of Chicago's lecture series on conservation and living Laudato Si, which calls for us to respond to the cries of the environment. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Our communities, uh, the cry of the environment, our communities and the world. We are coming to you today from St. Scholastica Chapel in Rogers Park. Living with gratitude for all the gifts which God has bestowed upon us has always been a way of life for the Benedictines. This is especially true of protecting our earth and those who dwell here with us. All creatures who dwell here with us. We are truly grateful to our guest speaker, Jerome McDonald, for sharing his time and talent as he presents Great Lakes Conservation. Jerome McDonald, I know many of you know, previously broadcast at WBEZ for almost four decades, and he continues to champion the cause of protecting our Great Lakes through an ethical response to the challenges our waterways face. He also strongly promotes social justice and global activism. Jerome is our 2022 recipient of the Spirit, that's this year, of the Spirit of St. Benedict Award. He will be presented with this honor at our testimonial dinner on Wednesday, June 8th. Please contact Joanne Spada here at the monastery if you are interested in attending. And now, without further delay, I'm happy to present Jerome McDonald. Thank you, Sister Judith. I'm going to uh, hold the microphone and hopefully I won't get it too close to my face and make it too loud. Um, I spent, as Sister Judith mentioned, uh, a large number of years. I was at WBEZ for 37 years and I hosted Worldview for 25 years. I did a little stint as an environmental reporter towards the end, and I um, produced a lot of talk shows. I was always a creature of the talk shows at WBEZ early in my career. And I'm going to give this talk in kind of a sequential move through my career as I learned about things about the Great Lakes and, and my life. I'm Although I'm hesitating, I will not show too many pictures of my vacations on the Great Lakes, but I will show a few. Um, I wanted to start with uh, this picture of Alewives. Uh, it's, uh, I, I was talking with Joanne, and Joanne and I are both about the same age, and we all remember the beaches as Alewives when we were kids. When I, when I first went to the beach over to my uncle's house. Uh, I, I loved going to the beach, but I didn't like all the dead fish there. And he assured me, he lived on South Shore, I lived in High Park, and we went there frequently. And he assured me that everything was going to be okay in the future because they were putting these coho salmon in the lake, and they were going to eat the alewives. And I thought, this is a act of uh, human ingenuity. This is uh, terrific that we're going to be able to uh, eat, get these fish off our beaches and, and uh, do away with them. So um, that was, uh, you know, I, I think of it now as, you know, that's a little boy thought, you know, we, we, were, we were thinking we were doing the right thing by, by putting the coho salmon in. Um, as I began my broadcast career, one of the shows I started uh, screening phone calls for was speaking of health with Quentin Young. I'm sure some of you remember Quentin Young. He was the head of Cook County Hospitals. He, uh, he was Harold Washington's personal physician. He used to be a physician for Martin Luther King when he came to town, and he was a great raconteur and had lots of friends. He'd have Mike Royko on the show and things like that. And one of his friends was this woman, Lee Botts, and she um, is really one of the terrific people when it comes to the Great Lakes. She founded the organization that became the Alliance to the, for the Great Lakes. Uh, she helped preserve the Indiana Dunes. She helped ban phosphates and PCBs. 
Um, she was a font of wisdom about sustainability and helped the city with its sustainability and waste reduction programs, the first ones the city's had. And uh, she had a great hour with Quentin Young and it really kind of opened my eyes to a couple of things. And one thing she said, never, never left me. And it was the, the Great Lakes are like an aquarium where we people put things in and take things out. And the whole idea of the Great Lakes as an aquarium, I thought it was like a natural, natural body of water, or it was like in a state of uh, nature. But she kind of reframed things for me and said, oh, we're just putting things in and taking things out now. Um, and that's the way I thought about it for some time. Um, but she's a great woman and we should put up a statue to her somewhere on the Great Lakes as, uh, as when we're putting up statues because she was really terrific. And her son actually works for the uh, Wetlands Initi Initiative now which is restoring wetlands throughout the area and even on farmlands, they've got great programs and she left a fantastic legacy in this community. And another person I have had the opportunity to talk to is Dan Egan. And he's a writer for the Milwaukee Sentinel. Um, has anybody read this book? It's pretty good. It tells all the tales you need to know about the Great Lakes, the death and life of the Great Lakes. And I'm going to kind of recount a couple of the tales in there. But um, uh, Dan is the Dean of Great Lakes Writers, really. And he had a beautiful thing in the New York Times not too long ago, just a, a couple of weeks ago. And it was largely about Chicago and Chicago's waterway and reversing uh, the Chicago River. Um, but this book uh, definitely, you know, I think it opens everybody's eyes when they read it because there's so much to know about the Great Lakes and he tells all the tales um, really well. And uh, one of the tales goes back to some of the issues before the Alewives. And um, that was this critter, which um, shocked Siobhan, but uh, Joanne knew what it was. And it's a... Um, sea lamprey. And these, there are lots of different kinds of lampreys out there in the world. There's a couple in our rivers now and things like that, but they aren't much of a problem. But these sea lampreys came swimming up the, the St. Lawrence Seaway as it got open. And they came into our waters and they uh, suck the blood out of fishes, as you can tell by their faces. They're blood sucking monsters. And uh, each sea lamprey could kill 40 pounds of fish. They were decimating our lake trout, all, like all the, uh, any, 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 any kind of fish. They were decimating uh, all sorts of native fish. And uh, they were this huge problem in the streams around here. Uh, this is the man that gained control of um, the, the sea lamprey situation. His name's Vernon Applegate. And the, the sea lamprey situation was starting to rev up in the 30s, and he came on the scene in the 50s. And he was a young uh, biologist. And when he was uh, in school, he decided his doctoral thesis would be on knowing everything about the sea lamprey in the Great Lakes. So he studied the wits out of it. He studied you know, where it bred, how long it bred, uh, he wrote the story of its life from beginning to end. And uh, that's how he figured out how they would kill it. So they would, uh, the, the, he went to the streams where the sea lamprey bred and they would, they take about six years to develop in the streams where they lay their eggs. And uh, if, and then they all, when they mature, they all come and go at the same time. They come to lay their eggs at the same time. They go out to see when they mature. And you can put up fencing and get a lot of them. You can, you know, scoop them out and kill them. Uh, and they began to doing that before he was done with his doctoral thesis. Once they figured it out, he was, he was, he was uh, doing that. But he knew that that wasn't going to do at all because these sea lamprey were... Um, uh, a gigantic problem. And so the, he began to test chemicals with, with people, I mean, with his colleagues. And he got hired by the, uh, the Department of Conservation in, uh, I believe, Michigan. 
and they would take uh, you know a, a bucket of water with a sea lamprey on in there and they would have a trout and they would have a bluegill and then they would dump the poison in and he just began testing chemical after chemical after chemical it was like a uh, Dan describes it as a moonshot. It was like a needle in a haystack. He had no idea what chemical was going to keep uh, uh, lamprey alive and, the, and keep, you know, kill the lamprey and keep the other fish alive. But uh, chemical 5,209, they went through 5,209 tries before they found something that just killed the lamprey. And that was in 1957. And then in 1961, they found a related chemical that worked even better. And so they set about going out and uh, killing all the sea lampreys in, in, in the streams so that, that they could. And uh, we still do that to this day. We spend $20 million a year to kill sea lampreys in the Great Lakes. And this is the only way we keep the sea lamprey population down and keep it from killing uh, all the other large fish in the lake, which it would be happily doing. Um, and so there's the Vernon Applegate Award for outstanding contributions to sea lamprey control. And those are the guys who are still out there killing your sea lamprey for you in the Great Lakes. Uh, they're getting awards. They work for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, which is a binational commission. They do it in Canada, they do it here. We go, they go to streams, they try to, they just keep killing. And uh, the only thing that might stop you from killing is a pandemic. And the pandemic kind of threw a wrench into things. And uh, so they stopped, uh, I had a little quote about how this, uh, during the pandemic, 90, they were planning right before the pandemic to spray 93 tributaries and 11 standing bodies of water. And instead they only sprayed 26 and six standing bodies of water. So the sea lamprey population will bounce back if you don't spray it. So they're, they're you know, we, can, we'll, we will see it. And if you looked at the populations, there's different lakes that have different bounces and they're missing them. And, you know, it's, a, it's an active going concern. And these guys, uh, one of the guys who got the award there, they're trying to devise different ways other than perpetual spraying to control these. They're trying to create, um, you know, like male only breeding, like neutered males that don't, uh, that, that only breed neutered males. And, and uh, so they're doing like genetic manipulation of these fish to try to neuter them and so that they kill each other out. But it's going to take a, a enormous diligence to get sea lamprey out of our seas. And, um, we, and we can't let our guard down. So I thought I'd kind of... Uh, bogged down on thinking about invasive species here for a second, because there's a lot of stuff that we do that we do perpetual killing of gypsy moths. Um, they're out there and we kill them every year with the gypsy moth population. They have a PR campaign because they say they try to get out and tell people, hey, if you see some gypsy moths, let us know so we can come and kill them because they're little caterpillars. Uh, kill everything. They, they've killed, since 1970, more than 83 million acres have been defoliated by gypsy moths in the U.S. They kill 300 different kinds of plants. They eat them. Uh, and we go out and spray the wits out of them every year to keep them in check. Um, that's pretty crazy. So that's, that's a flying insect that we're killing. When it comes to, to pl plants, it's a uh, you know, a complete open season of invasives out there. Uh, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources suggests that the annual cost of combating native plants is in excess of $35 billion. I don't know where that comes from or what that means, but I mean, just killing the buckthorn out there and the honeysuckle, and uh, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of invasive plants out there and people kill them publicly, privately, you know, Lake Forest is committed to killing all the buckthorn and its forest preserves and everything, but it's at, that's a costly operation. And insanely, um, we keep perpetuating these invasives at our garden centers. We, we sell things to plant in our yard, like Cali pear trees that are just going to 
become invasives um, in our communities and we will have to tear them out. Um, we've, we're, I'm kind of perpetually baffled that this isn't more news or wasn't more important to people or, you know, it seems like something we can do something about, but we never come to any consensus on this because uh, we want to sell things at the garden center and things like that. Capitalism, I guess. Um, all right, that's my digression on invasive species. I will get back to the lake. Um, here's another figure that is a interesting and seminal figure in the Great Lakes. He is the guy who um, put the uh, put the coho salmon in the Great Lakes there and there he is with a coho salmon. Uh, his name's Howard Tanner. He was with the Michigan Department of Conservation and he had a has an interesting story himself. He grew up in Michigan, but when he wanted to get a, when he came out of college, he he couldn't get a uh, job in Michigan, so he went out west and got a job um, in uh, western states. And he was working on water issues in like dammed up lakes and things like that. And he said it gave him a whole new perspective on what lakes were all about. And it was much more the aquarium perspective that we can put things. He's like, we're, we can build from the ground up what is going on in the water because it's an empty glass bowl and you, you make it what you want. And he came back after his experience out West uh, creating fish life in, in uh, man-made dams. And he went, had this issue in Lake Michigan with the alewives and he thought, and they, the Department of uh, Conservation in Michigan told him to be bold with his solutions. And he said, I will get salmon, you know, from out west, and I will put them in the lake, and they will eat the alewives for us. And we will create sport fishing in the lakes like we've never known it before. Now, um, Vernon Applegate, the other guy who was killing all the sea of the lamprey, he was killing them so that he could put lake trout back in the lake. And they are the apex predator. The natural apex predator of the Great Lakes is lake trout. They'll eat anything. Um, and they're, they're a fantastic uh, fish. They were adaptable to certain sections of the different sections, had different versions of lake trout that had adapted specifically to each region. So I'm, I'm like a guy who was like, I would certainly want to put lake, lake trout. I'm in the natives. I don't like invasives. I want to, I want to put the lake trout in like Vernon. But um, Howard wanted something better. So it's something that was good fit. It's not fun to catch a lake trout. It doesn't fight. It doesn't get very big. It doesn't taste super good. You know, like, a, like a salmon good uh, with a high fat content. So he wanted... Um, coho salmon and Chinook salmon. And that's what he brought here. And he didn't know if it would exactly work, but it worked fantastically and right away. And the, the guy in Wisconsin who, who saw the guy in Michigan doing it uh, felt under pressure. He didn't really wanna do, throw, throw the salmon in, but he did. And he said the first chance he when, when they went down there and threw the, threw the, uh, coho, the, the coho salmon in the water, you could see them uh, popping out of the water with alewives in their mouths like cigars. And he was like, God, this is going to work like a charm. And, and it did. They ate and ate and ate. And the, the, like the, uh, the charts for this are like, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, it usually takes coho salmon like three years to establish breeding size and all that. But in, in, in perfect instances, they can do it in one year and they did it in one year. And, and you know, their, their numbers, they didn't, you know, they were still breeding them and throwing them in the water, but they were breeding in the water and, and it went way, way up. Um, of course, uh, this, and this did create a gigantic fishing industry on uh, the Great Lakes and enormous economic activity where there was none. Um, it had, interesting uh, environmental benefits because so many people were eating the fish uh, and there was chemicals in the water and DDT and, and all these things that we had uh, put in the waters uh, 
they, um, there was more concern about the chemicals we're putting in the water because everybody wanted to eat these darn fish. And it created a constituency to advanced environmental causes. And Lee Motz was out there and, you know, trying to get all the PCBs and uh, chemicals out of the water. And this attention to the Great Lakes as a resource ended up, you know, working to the benefit of conservation, uh, it, it's been argued. So that's, um, that's quite an interesting uh, tale. And this guy is Howard Tanner is, con yeah, I think he's uh, 90 some years old now, he's alive. He's considered a god amongst the sport fishermen. Uh, the Dale Bowman, who writes for the Sun Times, has an article is uh, it just says Howard Tanner, God. You know, he's like they, they, they worship this guy because he had, he had created this fishing industry. And um, now we have a uh, fishing industry that's worth seven billion dollars annually, and it supports seventy five thousand jobs. And that uh, gets out there all the time. That news gets out there all the time. Uh, of course, the number of salmon has completely crashed in Lake Huron, and it is uh, down down a lot. There aren't there aren't that many alewives anymore. They've eaten them. We've eaten the fish that ate the alewives, um, but there's still some. There's enough to maintain a fishing industry in most of uh, the Great Lakes. But there's another thing that's working against the the salmon, and that's the um, mussels. And these are uh, charts of the zebra and quagga mussels as we've gone through time. So you can see here's everybody, everybody's heard of zebra mussels and think they're the terrible thing. And here's their spread in density uh, with the little red dots of the reporting stations. And then it gets really bad about 2000. And then it starts simmering down because this other mussel, the quagga mussel is going great guns. It starts, it gets really big here, it's uh, peaking and it's doing very, very well. Um, Dan Egan says that, I uh, talked to all these scientists and stuff and like the bottom of Lake Michigan is nothing but quagga mussels. It is, um, it is a quagga mussel lake. And uh, you might say, what eats quagga mussels now? And there are a few things that eat quagga mussels. Uh, there's a fish called uh, the round goby, which is also an invasive fish and is out competing a, another fish called the mottled sculpin, who is now an endangered fish. They're, they're like little egg eating fish. They're like the size of your finger, but these will eat the quagga mussels, but they can't eat them after they get bigger than their mouth. And since they're only as big as your finger, they, they, don't, they, they can't eat a lot of quagga mussels. Um, unusually, lake sturgeon also eat Quagga mussels. Um, they're the great, they're probably the biggest fish in the lake. They're, you know, sturgeon and uh, they are really endangered, but they have, they're bottom feeders and they have found a way to start eating quagga mussels. But they're, uh, you know, clearly they're not eating a ton of them, uh, but they're, uh, you know, it's going to, I, I saw a quote from a scientist who said, you know, quagga mussels are going to be with us for hundreds and hundreds of years, and they are um, a big problem. They, you know, like the zebra mussels, they clean out the water of the plankton, which is what everybody wants to eat. All the, uh, most fish want to eat the plankton and grow. Um, so they're, they're not all top feeders like the like the uh, like uh, well the uh, like the coho salmon they they can eat other fish they eat the plankton so uh, having a cleaned out lake is really dangerous it also creates um, sunshine on the bottom of the lake which starts creating nasty molds and things that you don't want so there's like multiple ramifications of having a lot of mussels on the lake. Um, The other big invasive problem uh, that everybody's heard about is the, uh, I think the invasive carp, the Asian carp as it's called, is, are coming up the river and uh, I would just, people have debates about you know, what they would do to the Great Lakes because they are not apex predators either. They wanna eat the little planktons and stuff that aren't in the Great Lakes right now. So it's, um, 
but everybody is completely afraid of them decimating the fishing industry as we know it. So they are, um, you know, keeping them out and going to great lengths. Uh, the, this dam here that they're building uh, at, it's the Brandon Road Project in Joliet. They just got it into the infrastructure bill, the first $225 million to build this barrier that will create a zone of chaos to keep the invasive car. <laughs> sounds like the Defense Department, doesn't it? Zone of chaos. <laughs> um, but they're, uh, so they're, they're at it and it's gonna, it would, the zone of chaos would cost $800 million over 10 years. So, you know, that is a lot of money to spend on, uh, on this. So, um, one of the people in, um, in, the, in the book I was referring to, The Life and Death of the Great Lakes, is John Dittmers. And he is a biologist for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, where they're giving out the Vernon Applegate Award and everything. And his quote about it is, as humans, we want to be in control, but we can't control the Great Lakes. We changed it, but we didn't necessarily control it. Uh, and I think that's a little more truth than the aquarium thing. We think we're controlling an aquarium, that off the cuff aquarium remark that kind of, kind of fixes it. And, and that, um, that the man who put the coho salmon in, uh, he, he also operates on that. But we, we think we can control it, we can't control it. And that is really the lesson to take about um, life in the Great Lakes. Um, I wanted to say one more thing about the Great Lakes that I find really interesting, and that has to do with wind power and offshore wind. And I did a story on this because I'm so curious about why it does or doesn't develop in this area. Um, New York this summer is going to start a, leasing submerged land in Lake Erie to wind developers, and they have the full weight of the state behind them. Um, Ohio was very far along with a uh, wind project and they, are, they had six kind of like starter windmills to put in the lake uh, right in front of Cleveland. And Ohio is like, got, I don't know if you followed it, one of the most wild corruption scandals on the universe in their um, power industry. And like the head of the ICC was convicted of bribery from coal and uh, fossil fuel interests, and he was the one who had kind of negotiated this thing through. And uh, there's also, uh, um, so it took a really long time just to get these six windmills going in, in Lake Erie. Um, and, but they're not, um, they're getting another, they're getting a Supreme Court challenge uh, that said that we that, didn't, that Ohio didn't do enough to figure out the birds and the, um, fish and the effect on wildlife that these things would have. And the Supreme Court is gonna rule on that any day now and, it's, and they could kill the whole project. The people have, who are gonna put it up, the Europeans who are gonna do this are kind of fatigued. It's still, it's alive by the skin of its teeth. But you know, why not offshore wind in Lake Michigan? I don't know if many of you probably remember in, and was the crux of my story was 10 years ago, there was a group in Evanston, they wanted to put uh, uh, offshore wind right offshore Evanston and start getting renewable power. Uh, they couldn't do it largely because it, it takes two things. It takes a port to assemble and take the wind out there, the, the windmills, and it takes a place to plug in to the grid. And Evanston didn't have either one of those things. But uh, Waukegan does, Waukegan's got a port and Waukegan's got a coal plant and a nuclear plant that just went out of business where you can plug in. So does the Calumet area, same thing. Uh, so those places are very viable and there are people in Illinois who are vaguely interested in doing this and, and bringing wind uh, to the area. Uh, in 2011, the legislature created the Lake Michigan Offshore Wind Advisory Council. Um, they created a permitting apparatus for the Department of Natural Resources, which has gone through that, and you can go on their website and see it. 
Um, you can see the legislature passed the Lake Michigan Wind Energy Act in 2013 to kind of do the economics of this. Jack Darren from the Sierra Club's on the, on the, on the board there, and so is uh, the man from the Alliance of, from the Great Lakes, Joel Brammeyer. Um, they're kind of negotiating uh, whether or not this is a good idea. The environmental community is half split. Half of them don't want anything in the Great Lakes, don't want to disturb the Great Lakes with these edifices that are ugly and uh, might have harm. And, and you know, they should do studies on, on the birds and, and whether the, this is a migratory path and they should check it out. But their offshore wind is going great in other countries. Um, I think Ireland's getting like 25% of its electricity right now from offshore wind. They, they're gonna be up to 75% by, the, by 2030 of their electricity from offshore wind. China is building offshore wind like crazy. Um, England has built a lot of offshore wind. And all the, the, the only places that are close to meeting their commitment are on, on climate change are doing it with offshore wind. It's, uh, I, I, you know, I would like to see a conversation about that in this area and see if people have the, the belly for it. Uh, some in, some environmentalists no, some yes, but uh, it seems like once energy people get a momentum, they will not stop. You know, if if there's an energy company, they'll build dams, they'll drill for oil, they'll frack, they'll do anything, and they will wear down any kind of opposition. That's usually the way it goes. Um, now we're gonna hit my vacation pictures or get pretty close to them. Uh, one of the things I just, I, I think the Great Lakes are just really cool and beautiful and a great place to vacation. And I'm sure we've all done some vacationing and had fun around the Great Lakes. Uh, I went to the uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore and uh, with my kids and we went camping and we uh, did it at the old campsite that only has pit toilets and it's really fun. And we liked it so much, we went right back again the next year. And one of the things that was going on on the beach was this craziness. This is a Lyle cannon. Have anybody ever seen one of these before? And have any idea what this thing is doing? Um, so here's the cannon. It's like a teeny little cannon. And, um, they were shooting this off on the beach. So we went down there to check it out and it was a, a rescue station. It was an old rescue station and this is how they used to rescue people on the Great Lakes. Um, during the winter of 1870 and 1871, 214 people lost their lives in shipwrecks on the Great Lakes. And then Congress appropriated money to create the US Life Saving Service. Um, remarkably, a lot of people were losing their lives really close to the shore. You, I mean, that's where the boats end up hitting things that they, when they're trying to get close. And um, so this is one of the devices they used. And I, I don't have the full scope of the device, but I just took the exciting cannon part. But this, um, so you, you take a... Um, it doesn't have like a regular cannonball. It has like an elongated cannonball with a, at the top of it is a hook and you tie a rope to the hook. The rope comes out of this little box where they've winded it up with on little stakes in the box, little wooden stakes in the box. And it's wound in such a way that it's, it's a 400 foot long rope, but it won't tangle. It won't tangle when you take it out and shoot it out of a cannon. So they take the box and the thing over and they flip it over. They attach it to that. They, they shove the thing in there and they blast this thing out into the lake 400 feet to where the boat is. Then they run another larger rope out there that has kind of a, uh, um, a, a kind of a chair and a, um, a, uh, one of those wheelie things on it, a chair and a wheelie thing. Uh, and you, and, and you, they were wheeling people, you know, putting them in these little wheelie things and bringing them back from uh, shipwrecks. It, you know, it's pretty, it's crazy. And they were unbelievably 
successful with this? I mean, it sounds like the most crazy thing that would never rescue anyone and would take forever, but they were, um, they rescued over 178,000 people. Their success rate was an astounding 99%. They, were, they had boats too, and they had um, other things, and they operated on the Atlantic uh, shore as well. But I mean, this is what eventually became our Coast Guard. It was called like a, uh, a breaches buoy or something. It was the thing that they um, were, took people back and forth on. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're like the social stories that are of our interactions with the Great Lake were uh, really interesting to me. So I kept following up. Janet and I, we decided to start doing vacations and try to go around Lake Superior. And we went up once and did a little bit and went up once and then we went up and we were a little, we're a little bit over. We haven't done the Canadian part. We haven't been able to get up there, but um, we've gotten right next to the Canadian part. And um, one of the places we went to was the Shipwreck Museum, and that's the Shipwreck Museum, because you know, we know all about the Lyle gun. We also, while we were there, we started, you know, we, I, I said we did it twice, and I, I bought fins and goggles for everybody, and we went and looked at the shipwrecks that are up there by those two islands, North and South Manitou Island. There's like a, a cove there, and they, uh, there was a lot of shipwrecks, and you can see some of them in pretty shallow water, so it's fun. And then we went to, of course, we had to go to the Shipwreck Museum when we were over in the Upper Peninsula looking for that. And uh, it's more, you know, that's the, the little lighthouse there. It's kind of by Sault Ste. Marie, and it's, it is in the middle of nowhere. It was a long drive in the middle of nowhere. That's a Fresnel lens. This is how, this is the things, these are the things that, um, that were in the lighthouses that shined the light out. They're like, Every one of these little things is like a little refractor thing. And you put the oil lamp in the middle and that is how you shine the beam out to, uh, to, to make a lighthouse back in the day before they had electricity. And they were, they, these things are made in France. They're expensive, they shipped them over. That one's giant. There's a lot of, of them that are a lot smaller. Um, the museum is, is well worth checking out the uh, they, their main claim to fame is the bell from the Edmund Fitzgerald. They went and dove down to the, which sunk in 1972, and they went and they took that bell out and they put a bell with all the names of the uh, people who perished in the thing, and they dropped that one into the wreckage and took the regular one out. And um, there's a lot of interesting stories. I like the Shipwreck Museum. <laughs> There's just pretty pictures. The lake's really pretty. Pictured rocks, uh, my wife and I had never been there. It's gorgeous. You can walk along the top of it. There's kind of a big hike along the top of it. And you can go into the bottom of it. There's my wife up there on some rock up there in the middle of the ocean. The vistas are fantastic. I mean, Lake Michigan's big, but Lake Superior feels bigger. And there's like, you can plop yourself down in kayaks. There's little services that take you out in kayaks and they run you right up to the good stuff and they drop a bunch of you in there and you can paddle around and see all this stuff. It's fantastic. Um, as we went around, uh, this is on Madeline Island. This is one of the Apostle Islands as you're moving around the Great Lakes and you're up by Bayview. And one of the cool things is uh, they claim that they're the first place in the U.S. that has all their signs in um, Ashinaabe. They, they have indigenous language uh, signs, all of them translated. Uh, there's, uh, the, the islands are sacred to the Ashinaabe, and they are, you know, there's a lot more indigenous presence up there. It's uh, really positive, I think. They're doing such great work opposing uh, line three and line five, the oil pipelines that are um, being built so that we can have more fossil fuels to kill ourselves with. And uh, they're also doing really interesting things. You know, I mentioned the sturgeon, the, uh, there's an indigenous group in Michigan that is uh, developed a, um, a rescue plan for the sturgeon 
And it's really hard because sturgeon are, you know, I mentioned the lake trout have a long gestation period. They don't breed right away and things, but sturgeon, it takes them 20 years before they breed. So you're, you're it's, but you know, the indigenous have a long game on this. They're like, we can long game this thing. And we, and they've innovated some techniques in sturgeon breeding and they use the rivers too and everything. Uh, and now the, the departments of natural resources copied them and are using uh, the, the indigenous developed uh, conservation technique uh, around the Great Lakes now. So, I, and so yay for the indigenous. Um, here is more stuff we found out about the indigenous. Uh, we, when we were right up to the top of Lake Superior uh, and where you're in Minnesota and you're kind of now on the north end of the, the tip as they call it in Minnesota, if you go right to the tip, there is a national park there. It's the Grand Portage National Park. And it's, um, I didn't know anything about this, but there was an eight mile track to the Pigeon River. The Pigeon River is it almost everything as it comes to Lake Superior up there goes down waterfalls and cliffs and stuff. And so does the Pigeon River. And the Pigeon River is the thing that connects to the entire Northwest uh, world. All you can go by boat to all through Canada, and they did. The indigenous there uh, kind of started co trapping with uh, a lot of the settlers. And for 200 years, they trapped beavers and stuff. They trapped almost all the beavers from Minnesota to the Rocky Mountains. Uh, they, they almost cleaned out the whole thing. And they would all come to this, this point here, do this final trek to Lake Superior, this eight mile walk. And there would be a big, there's a big fort there. And it was run by this Scottish trading company. And um, people would begin to trade and barter. And uh, then these guys, these French voyageurs, as they were called, were the guys who had copied the indigenous uh, birch bark canoe techniques and took all these pelts and stuff to Montreal from the end of in a birch bark canoe. Like I, I you know, I can't. They had thirty foot long birch bark canoes there, and so I'll, so they're doing recreations at this national park. They've rebuilt the fort. There, there, there's guys dressed up as voyagers. There's uh, all this stuff going on. They're they're building these birch bark canoes, and um, kind of reenacting this. You know, the guy called it, uh, you know, two or three hundred years of globalized trade that they were doing there that darn near cleaned out all the beavers in the entire um, North American continent, basically. Um, and, you know, they're building these birch bark canoes and the indigenous taught them how this black stuff is how you keep it from leaking. It's... Um, it's three different things. It's bear grease, of course, you gotta have bear grease, and then you gotta have pine tar, and then you have coal ash. It's kind of like ash from the fire, and you put it all together and grease up your boat and it kind of dries up, and then they would take a bucket of them with them when they paddled to Montreal in case they needed to do some patching. Isn't that crazy? Um, so there's a guy dressed up as a voyager with his little red hat. They all have little red hats and stuff. And um, I, you know, I, I, you know, I never expected to get so much history and make me think so much about the Great Lakes. Uh, when I was traveling and doing this, I was in it for the outdoors. I was in it for the plants. I was in it for this. But I got suckered by the shipwrecks and the lighthouses and um, the voyagers. I'm, I'm a complete sucker for all that stuff now and I'm always going into the um, the lectures and uh, I you know and I've learned a lot and I've learned a lot about how people have evolved with the Great Lakes and I am very happy to have had that opportunity. Um, I, I thought I'd kind of end with a pretty picture of the Great Lakes while I say something that's on pictured rock again uh, about 
uh, you know, the St. Benedict Award, it's very nice of you to give me the spirit of St. Benedict Award. Uh, a, I feel uh, completely at home and comfortable with you people. And I would have done that, you know, the great thing about my career was I could have done a talk similar to this about a bunch of different things. I could have talked about Ukraine. I had a great relationship with Ukraine. We used to do a program um, before I started doing Worldview with uh, Radio Kiev, the shortwave radio station in the Soviet Union. And we did great programs and had interesting people on. We had Saul Bellow come on and ask the Soviets if they're, they're, they're reading his books and stuff like that and talk about agricultural policy and all sorts of things. And I've um, kept up with Ukraine and have great uh, you know, sympathy and affection for what's going on there. One of my producers is, uh, my, my old producers is a Ukrainian who's working for, a Ukrainian American who's working for National Public Radio now. He was in seminary school in Kiev. He comes from a 400 year long line of Ukrainian Catholic priests. And he was going to fulfill his destiny and, and become a Ukrainian Catholic priest. He still will, but they, you know, he was in seminary school for about two months before the war started. And, and then he switched back to doing some journalism and is, is doing reports now on National Public Radio. Yeah, I could have done a, this talk about development issues or sustainability. Uh, I feel very close to environmental restoration. I really am interested in the wealth gap and the oligarchy and, and, and nonviolence. Um, these are things I all learned about. And, you know, I'm not an expert in the Great Lakes, but I, I know enough to know a few things. And I would have been very... Uh, happy to talk about them. And I've been happy to just have the opportunity to learn about these things. When I was doing the show, I, I tried to just, uh, I came into it thinking, you know, I got an opportunity to be the good media and I can be whatever I want. So I tried to do a lot more on development. I thought, you know, 50% of people in the world don't have enough uh, medicine or healthcare or uh, education or need more money. I should be doing more on that. I don't wanna just talk about bombs and wars all the time. I wanna talk about development. And I think we found good ways to do that. I wanted to talk more about the environment and climate. I'm you know, clearly concerned about what's happening on, on uh, that level. I wanted more representation and I wanted to think about people um, I want people to care about other people around the world. Uh, we should, if something is happening in the Philippines, we should be able to connect to them and, and talk about it and be aware and uh, be a real witness to, to suffering or uh, changes that are happening. I wanted to be more even handed about that. We used to have a map where we would put up pins and make sure that we were, we were, um, you know, divide, dividing our time around the world in a pretty equal fashion. That worked until the Iraq war, then that did not work. Um, so I never, you know, I tried to be skeptical of power. I tried to, you know, not stay away from the many contradictions that US policy has. Uh, you know, I didn't do things to be popular. I wasn't trying to, you know, I didn't think I had to satisfy a ratings quota. People wanted more listeners, but weren't, weren't, you know, crazy for ratings. And I was very happy, you know, by the time I left, uh, my friends were not advertisers or wealthy donors or politicians, or even, you know, I didn't hang out with a lot of other journalists. I was friendly with um, immigrant justice groups, refugee groups, environmentalists, people who are involved with healthcare and education, refugee rights. I'm on the board of Chicago Fair Trade now and uh, I'm trying to promote ethical commerce. I'm very friendly with the biking community and the alternative transportation community and sustainability things. So um, that's, uh, yeah, I'm proud of that. I'm glad for all that. So I feel pretty at home with Benedictine nuns and I feel okay accepting uh, the Spirit of St. Benedict Award for all those reasons. And thank you very much for giving it to me.
I'll be happy to talk about anything you want now. You, if you have any questions or anything. That's um, pictured rocks again. I, I, I took only pictured rocks. Uh, pictured, pictured rocks National Lakeshore. And uh, that's from the top. There's a trail you can, you can walk. Uh, we saw a bunch of uh, Boy Scouts hiking the trail. You can hike it for miles and miles along the lakeshore there. But there's like a five mile strip that's gorgeous. And it's about a two and a half mile walk in on either side of the five mile strip. So it's like a 10 mile hike, but, and it's like the most beautiful hike I've ever seen. And the people who, you know, the, I was reading articles about the hike and they compared it to like the Grand Canyon. It's like so gorgeous. It's hard to believe, you know, and it changes every time you go around the corner and it's just really gorgeous. It's superior. Lee Botts, yeah. Um, she's well worth knowing. If, if you Google her, you'll see a lot of articles. She got a big obituary. She died relatively recently and uh, got a big obituary in the New York Times. And uh, yeah, she was quite the, quite, the, quite the mover. Anybody else? Uh, well, opening up the St. Lawrence Seaways is the thing that attracted um, the sea lamprey and the alewife. We, we, there used to be natural barriers uh, to, to fish, and he goes through it really good in the book. And they were like, we, when we wanted to start sending ships through, we had to blow through rock and stuff like that. And so we opened up a, the St. Lawrence Seaway to... to, to <laughs> well, uh, they have kind of like wide open eating, you know, they, they, they see a, a new place where there's uh, the plankton that they want to eat. Those alewives want, always wanted to eat the little plankton guys that were so prevalent all over the Great Lakes. And they, they went up there and that, the little sea lamprey sea fish that they can suck on and they're going to, they, they go naturally upstream, the, the sea lamprey push up. So if there's a force coming at them, they're going to go up it and go to see what's in the other end. So sea lamprey are like completely geared to go up the stream as, as, as other fish are. Isn't that awful? <laughs> so many things come up there and ruin our lake. I don't know. Did they ruin it? Not, not really. It's so beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. I am not. I'm going to beg off of that one. Yeah. Yeah, they have, uh, it's dry, dry dryness. So this epic drought out there in the West is going to dry those things up. Yes. Sea lamprey. C lamprey, L A M P R E Y, lamprey. Does it live anywhere that's not? Uh, well, I, I think in the in, in the open sea, it is a saltwater animal essentially, and um, I think there's a more of a balance there. You know, it's kind of it, there's it has predators there, but here it doesn't. But up in the lakes, it doesn't have one. But there's a, lampreys come in a lot of versions. We have them in our streams um, now, but they're they're just not blood suckers. They're 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 kind of uh, they're they feed off gunk in the lake too. They're not they're, they're not uh, um, yeah they're bottom feeding kind of dudes, and uh, so there's good lamprey and bad lamprey, and that that one's definitely bad, isn't it? And yeah, they just came up, they just came up the stream, they did their thing, they did what they were supposed to. We let them, 
Um, you know, I mean, Dan Egan argues in the book for closing the Great Lakes and this, uh, the two foreign vessels so that you don't get any mussels, you don't get any, and there's not many who come in, but the ones that do come in, they drop stuff that is completely crazy on us and it's bad. So, um, you know, I mean, the, the out West, they're all still, they're fighting our zebra and quagga mussels in they they're they're spending twenty thousand dollars to train every dog to sniff for mussels on boats when and when you put in in a lake out west you get your boat sniffed uh, before you drop it in because they don't want those things coming in their lakes but it's it's inevitable probably and then their rivers um all the rivers and and um Washington and Oregon and all that, they, they're, they're working very diligently to keep those muscles out of their lakes. No, no, you cannot solve the quagga muscle problem with your appetite. <laughs> <laughs> no amount of enjoying muscles is going to do it. So you said that, were you talking about people considering boating to the north? Two, well, two foreign boats, um, the, the lock system and stuff, um, because that's what is bringing in the muscles that are, um, there's other things, the round goby traveled in a, in a hull that is eating all the eggs. Um, the sea lamprey is, you know, relatively is, you know, something that swam. So is the alewife. They didn't come in boats, but um, we let them in when we built these locks and things that uh, move people. The Great Lakes kind of go like this as they go to the sea, and you needed locks to get the boats and traveling things in. And and when you did that, you created something the fish could go up. Well, sea lamp brand stuff. Complicated. <laughs> Thank you.